So, fundamentally, what we need to do by two o'clock is come up with three things that can be done to make a difference when it comes to reward and recognition for an open culture. That's what I'm going to try and drive us towards. Um, what we're going to do is uh, do it as follows. Um, we've got two colleagues who are going to make some short presentations. Their, their, their job is to provoke us. Um, and are going to spend between eight and ten minutes um, set, setting the scene in that way. And then we'll go into a discussion around what the challenges are and, and to identify solutions. And the crucial thing is, when you do make your contributions, whilst identify the challenge, it's more important from my perspective is you, you come up with some of the solutions so we, we can actually think about what we can do. So, let me come to Vilma. Vilma van Weizenbeek. Kurt and I uh, just discussed that I will be leading up to the really provoking uh, words by uh, Kurt. Um, it's a really a pleasure to be here and to be invited uh, to speak very uh, shortly on this day uh, that we start uh, with the Knowledge Equity Network. And um, so who am I? I'm, as uh, was introduced, uh, currently the Director of um, Student Education Affairs at the Freie Universiteit. And I've, perhaps you read that in the program, I have also spent some time at a scientific publisher. I worked at Elsip here. <laughs> so I'm a bit provocative anyway. Then. And I also worked at the library, at the TU Delft uh, Library. So I've been working on open access and open science for quite some, some time. Um, and but what's my connection and why I'm invited here on this topic, uh, reward and recognition for an open culture, uh, is that at the time I was uh, working in Delft, I've, perhaps you know, six years ago, um, it's a long time actually, <laughs> if I think about it, uh, there was a congress on open science in Amsterdam and then we had the Amsterdam call for action. And then there were council conclusions and every member state was asked to write or to make a national plan. And then I was asked, I was involved in that, uh, in that Congress, I was asked by the Ministry of Education, Culture and Sciences to, to write that national plan, Open Science for the Netherlands. So I have, and actually I had a few slides. So I have uh, written the first, um, as a main author, of course, uh, not on my own, the first national plan, Open Science for the Netherlands, 2017 and 2020. And now here you see, actually, we just launched the next, the second national plan, and with the same pillars that we already had in uh, 2017. It's about what we then called citizen science. It's about open access, open scholarly communication, fair, open research data, and transparent scientific processes. And here, of course, you see the vertical here is recognition and, 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 and rewards. So what I bring to the table, two things. And actually, it's perhaps also more focusing on the why and understand before two o'clock we need to have the three actions. But I think it's so essential to stimulate in every sense of the way people to be as open as possible. And I also think, and it was also said this earlier this morning, that it's essential that we have institutional leaders, institutional leadership that um, have a fair and consistent way in reward and recognition. So those are the two things that I wanted to say today. And I end up with some examples from the Netherlands, so I will become a bit more uh, uh, concrete. Um, so I talked about my uh, connection, the Amsterdam Call for Action, and then Afterwards, I also was, when I was library director, I was also program manager open access for the Netherlands, for the <coughs> University of the Netherlands, and then leading the, 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 the open scholarly communication uh, um, thread. And I did the first transformative agreement with Springer, the compact agreement. So that's, 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 that's the way of my, of my background. And I think research of recognition rewards are very connected to open science. And that we want, in one way, really to stimulate our students, our teachers, our, re our researchers to be as open as possible. But it's also an opportunity to see science and research in a different perspective. And I want to, I have, I'm not going to read this, but just a part of it, because I read over summer a book from Frank Minema. You might know him, heard of him. He's 
at the University of Utrecht, now really into open science there, but he was the dean of the medical faculty. And he wrote a book on open science. It's called Open Science, the Very Idea. I would really recommend uh, you to read it. And there's just a few lines that I would like to read out of this book. And he says, one of the major still current problems is that although there might be a generally felt frustration by the majority of scientists in academia, the academic leadership does not immediately recognize, flatly denies or rebuts, but this is how science is. When issues are discussed, it, has, is, it is at this management level and not in the daily environment of researchers where a change is needed. So Minima really makes a plea for a pragmatic theory of scientific inquiry that is open, non-dogmatic, and pluralistic, inclusive, and contextual. When scientific research is really seen as a means to an end, and with the ultimate aim to address and alleviate problems and issues that prevent people from having their good life, from living the good life, and to achieve reliable knowledge. So, therefore, and it was said earlier on also, science must constantly engage with the public. Um, policy issues, like you also just uh, uh, explained, Simone, in the panel, get a very different, more practical context if uh, representatives from the public that are concerned and are affected are involved. And there the turn to open science is, is actually made, because opening up of science uh, should ideally promote equality, inclusion, and diversity of our research agendas. And this requires an, an open society, an open culture, where um, you have a place for debate. That was also mentioned earlier. Where uh, there is a safe place, and there is a diversity of publics. And working on this, working on this open society, working on this open culture, <coughs> That should be rewarded and recognized. So I promised also a few examples. Um, so going back to recognition and rewards and um, the way we are dealing with it currently at the Netherlands, this is, a, I thought, a very nice overview of what it is if you talk about open science. I took it from my previous uh, working place, the TU Delft. Um, here the contact, Esther Plomp. Uh, and there you see, there is so much. It's, uh, it, it doesn't say actually open culture anywhere here in these bubbles, but it does say <coughs> open, sorry, open participation, uh, open engagement, open education. So I think this is a, is a whole ecosystem of things that we all uh, could uh, let fall under open science. And then we also would want people we want to stimulate people working on that. Then the next, it's an empty slide. Oh, I think it belts up. Ah, oh, wait, 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 wait. So this is, um, so every um, university in the Netherlands is working on the pillars of, of, of the national plan uh, open science. And this is just an example of, of my current university, the Freie University, is doing on recognition and rewards, talking about leadership. So my uh, a, a rector, we call it in, uh, in Dutch, uh, Jeroen Geurts, is taking leadership here on this topic, recognition and rewards, working on research assessment, um, on a teacher framework, um, we're having a lot of debates, uh, workshop sharing, uh, good practices, um, and, and, and one of the things uh, that helps is, is credit. I think it's too much to go through, but just an example of what we are doing at the FU. And another of the universities that are very active in the Netherlands on the topic of recognition and rewards, and I thought, I thought especially this slide is interesting to see, is the uh, Utrecht University. And there, it's, as I mentioned, Frank Minema, eh, who is from Utrecht. And there you see how we want to move from the past to the future, from a very of science focused on the individual performance, science focused on, on quantity. And we want to take that to a future where you have dynamic career paths, 
where the outcome is based on, on narratives and social engagement. And um, it's, it's all based on team effort. So what I said, and I, I think I should stop and give the floor to, to Kurt, is what I said, I think it's, it's, it's so important that we stimulate stu students, teachers, and re researchers to be as open as possible. And we should discuss, if we have good practices here, how we can act upon that. And we need these <coughs> institutional leaders on the top, but also mid middle management leaders that will help us achieving that. So, thank you. Vilma, thank you very much indeed. <clears throat> so the, the thing that really struck me in amongst that was this notion of, of rewarding the, the team rather than necessarily the individual. Kurt. <clears throat> so uh, uh, our next provocateur is Kurt Rice, uh, the director of the Norwegian University of Life Sciences. So Kurt, over to you, and if you could keep, keep it short, that would be really appreciated. You have to keep me short then. Okay. <clears throat> um, thank you. Thank you for the chance to be here. Uh, I would like to say, by way of introduction, and I want this included in any published version of this, that I've been specifically asked to try to be provocative, so I'm going to say things that I don't necessarily mean and I don't want to be quoted on it. Uh, <clears throat> after having said that, which I know will be included in the published version, I'd like to start by uh, acknowledging uh, Simona's leadership on this point and the whole team here at Leeds for uh, preparing a situation where we can come flying in for one full day and have such incredible engaged and stimulating uh, discussions. It's really been a treat, so thanks for that. I had been asking myself as I prepared for this, <clears throat> what are three things that I would like to put on the table from the draft uh, that, we've, that we've all seen? And I'd like to share those uh, with you. Uh, uh, the first of them involves sustainability. Simona said in her talk this morning that solving inequality will lead us to solve our global challenges. <clears throat> and the most important global challenge we have today is, is about sustainability. Sustainability is a particularly special case of the opportunity for cooperation and collaboration instead of competition. You can't win at being the sustainability university if what that means is the others don't become sustainability universities. You can win at being the engineering university by driving the others out of the business. But if you want to win at being the sustainability university, the way to do that is to get everybody else with you because it doesn't matter if you're the only one doing sustainability. And that's a fundamentally different kind of leadership task than the competitive kind of leadership task. And I would suggest that it requires a different kind of leadership. You have to be comfortable with identifying a profile and other people going past you. That's your victory, right? And that relates to the, the feelings that we have about competitiveness versus uh, collaboration. So I think that <clears throat> the role of sustainability here is particularly Im important and, and, and our success at doing that really is the ultimate example of reward and recognition. And for that reason, just as a very specific uh, point of feedback to the document, I'd like to see the position of sustainability even more uh, prominent. Um, I, I would like to see that as the overarching uh, driver for uh, the pursuit of knowledge equality. And just to say a couple more words about that, we talk often about sustainability in the domain of nature, in the domain of economics, in the domain of societal development. And the document starts by mentioning some challenges to sustainability in the, with respect to the environment, but then it sort of doesn't say any more about that, and I'd like to, uh, to, to, to work on that uh, a little bit more, to talk about things like um, energy in the context of providing education. What does that mean? When we send millions of documents back and forth on the internet, what are we doing to the sustainability of the world and, and a zillion other examples? In the context of sustainable economics, we've talked some about uh, how to work for open offerings uh, for everyone and, and for access to everyone, but actually we've, we've been talking maybe more about access and less about offerings. And I'd like to see us uh, reflect and in a way that more directly confronts campus-based education 
as the core model. I think that relates not only to economic sustainability, but is absolutely central for uh, knowledge equality. And finally, on this first point about sustainability, uh, societal structures, this cannot be underplayed, right? Inequality in societal structures really is the most genuine threat to democracy. And the work that we can do in this network to promote knowledge equality directly confronts that threat and thereby directly supports the further development of democratic approaches to governance. Point one, then, is about sustainability. Point two is about activism, which I touched on, on my, in my question this morning, but I'd like to take a more radical version of it. So capitalism in the form of, of publishers who are, whose business model is to break the backs of public universities is, of course, a particularly obnoxious example of anti uh, equality in, in the distribution of knowledge. But what about other things like sexism, like culture, like religion, fundamentalism that has also as a tenant that it should be opposed to the scientific mention and, uh, method and thereby to knowledge equality? So should we as the Knowledge Equality Network take a position on the Taliban? If you ask me what is a great threat to knowledge equality today, one of my answers is the Taliban. The Taliban is a great threat to knowledge equality because they don't want women to have knowledge. What does that mean to us in the formation of a network? That was my second point about activism. And my third point, <clears throat> which I'll use the next three and a half minutes on, is about <clears throat> the tyranny of excellence. And my thesis is that Knowledge equality is undermined by systems of reward and recognition that are constructed under the tyranny of excellence. Excellence is the fetishized pseudo-codification of the pinnacle of competition. And our commitment to leave relentless competition behind in favor of radical collaboration entails an abandonment of excellence as the guiding criteria for everything that we do. That is good news because excellence is undefinable in the scientific uh, context. In its con uh, a, a, a notion providing uh, conservativeness in uh, not only the distribution of money, but also the kind of science that gets pursued. In other words, excellence implies inequality. It implies distinguishing the excellent from the non-excellent. And the pursuit of equality uh, entails its abandonment. This is, uh, for those reasons that I just said, it needs to be uh, replaced. Furthermore, the, the construction of science on the back of, of this fetishized pseudo-codification of excellence is directly responsible for the loss of public trust in science since it doesn't work. So that should be replaced by other principles like capacity building, like breadth, like soundness, like comprehensiveness, like accessibility, where those should become the kinds of criteria that we want to advocate for as criteria that can feed uh, knowledge equality as opposed to undermine it in the way that excellence does. Believe it or not, I could talk about this for a lot longer. <laughs> But I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for being timely. So, so uh, I think the thing that I've, I'm taking away from Kurt's uh, uh, delivery there was what the, the question is: accessibility a replacement for excellence? Um, Right, thank you very much. So we're going to go into uh, discussion. I want to remind you again that we're about identifying um, solutions to, that we can take forward. Um, I would ask those people that are online to please keep their cameras and microphones off until we ask you to or invite you to come and, and contribute, please. If those of you in the room could refrain from having small group conversations, that'd be really helpful because the microphones won't pick it up and the people that are online won't know what's going on. Um, if you'd like to uh, speak, if you could let, stick your hand up and, and wait for Tom to get to you when I direct him to you, because he's got the microphone so we, we can hear what's going on. Um, and if you're online, please, if you could indicate in chats that you'd, you'd like to, to make a comment and raise your hand, uh, and I will, uh, Jed will, will, will alert me to uh, that when it happens. Um, 
OK, and my, my aim is for about five, ten minutes before the end is to just try and summarise where we think we've got to in the conversation to, to, to get a sense check from you that, that I'm capturing what's been said. Is that OK? So, S can I just ask you, just to be clear, we're not having a small group discussion on our table? No, it's, the plenary. it's plenary discussion, and the, the idea is that we need to make sure that the people that are online can hear us. Kat, would you, would you like to go first? Thank you. Thanks. Hi, Kat Davis, Dean for Research Culture here at Leeds. Um, thanks for the two opening talks. Um, I think as we've been tasked with the, the concrete here, um, I'm not going to start with you know the why or the what. I think we know why we need to reward and recognise open research, and I think we know what we need to do. What, sorry, what forms of open research we need to reward, as we've seen from that buffet slide earlier. Um, I think I'd like to concentrate on the how, so what actual rewards and, and forms of recognition that we're going to be talking about. Now, note, and this is a side note, that reward and recognition are two different things. For me, recognition is more powerful. Um, but I think the first thing to do is to engage with our community. What would be meaningful to them? Those forms of reward need to be varied and meaningful. So time at a certain career stage is useful. It may be less useful at a different career stage. Networks, the same. Funding, the same. This is not a one-size-fits-all thing. Um, but I'll just throw a, a few kind of examples, I suppose. So funding, I think, uh, you know, I'm constantly lobbying the funders for... Um, schemes that explicitly recognise open research and research culture more widely. I think that really focuses minds when money and time uh, is on offer. I think promotion and recruitment criteria, of course, are, are a really powerful form of reward and recognition. Um, yeah, so I suppose I'd put time and funding into resource and then um, promotion and recruitment criteria. Um, for the second. And just if I can tell a really short story, I was in leadership forum the other day. Um, I don't know if you remember Simone and others here. Um, we were talking about a job description for a new director of one of our institutes. And one of the colleagues said, we need a, a bullet point there on research culture. And I was so pleased to hear that. And straight away, I was asked for that wording, for that bullet point, And to the best of my knowledge, that is in there now. So that's a fairly easy win. Thank you very much, Kat. Who else? Selena. Thank you. And um, Selena Stead, Executive Dean for the Faculty of Environment here at the University of Leeds. Um, I'm going to cut to the chase on an idea for a solution. Um, thinking about the reward and the recognition, I think it's important that not only can we find a way of individuals to be rewarded, Awarded where they demonstrate examples of open um, culture, um, open outputs, especially when it's in knowledge exchange. But I want to talk a little bit about the reward system. And what I was thinking of, it comes from the Canadian system. So in Canada, the, um, the chairs, leaders, managers, part of their promotion, recognition and reward is based on the success of their mentorship and so what I was thinking, because leadership came up, it would be really good if we could find that it needs to be a dual process, that we could actually reward leaders for changing the culture in open access, and at the same time, there is a reward for the output. So I just, the proposal solution is we've got to get the leadership as well. And I think if that is built in, as well as um, those, I expect leaders, and um, individuals. I just want to float that as an idea of how we can actually promote um, this process. Selena, thank you very much. Oh, crumbs. Right. So um, there was a question at the back. There's a question here. The, 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 the gentleman with the, the, the pink check shirt on. Sorry, I can't re read your label. Good afternoon, everyone. Nigel Harkness. I'm here from the uh, from Newcastle University, just a few miles north of Leeds. Um, I guess two, one challenge to us, which I don't have an answer to, and then one thing which I think I'd like to throw out. One is the two interventions have talked about open research, and I think we are, as a sector, there's been a lot of thinking about open research. We're quite far down that road. I think we understand perhaps better what that is. 
we can't reward open research if we're not also thinking about open education. We've already had this discussion with Kat that um, you, know, you have to think, if we've got research culture, we have to think about education culture here. I don't have an answer to that one because I don't feel that I'm as far down the road in my faculty on open education in Newcastle than we are with open research. Um, I think it's really interesting thinking about promotion criteria and job descriptions. One of the problems with those processes is that they are closed and untransparent. For good reasons, they have to be confidential processes, but that breeds stories which may not reflect the facts that were in the room at the time. So no one ever knows why they were promoted, but they will come up with a reason why they were promoted, and that narrative is often about other things, and it is often about, kind of it can be about research rather than education, so we need somehow to think about how we, if we are going to reward and recognise, how we tell the stories of that rather than just write it into documents. That's my thinking on that. Thank you very much. Let's, Kate, you, you had a, a question. Kate here. Karen, right, sorry, I, sorry, I can see Kate's label. <laughs> oh, no, Karen. Karen, thank um, you. Uh, Karen Salt, uh, uh, UK Research Innovation Deputy Director there. Um, I, I, I will be speaking with Gino later. Um, uh, well, two, two quick things for me. I, I think the, the first is um, I'm, I'm, I'm often fascinated when I hear conversations about reward and recognition and um, uh, aspects of culture of fall under my remit and um, the, the giant behemoth of UKRI, but um, uh, because the question for me is who? Who is being rewarded and who is being recognized? And I'm quite fascinated when that reward and recognition is about some imagined career track of researchers um, or some imagined track of a particular kind of person who's engaged in a particular kind of work, but not necessarily professional services not necessarily the public engagement team, not necessarily the comms team, not necessarily a whole set of people, library, information services, who might be just as instr instrumental to creating open culture. So my challenge, I think, to the room is how do we not narrowly define what we're talking about with reward and recognition so that we essentially create a hierarchy of those who get access to this revolutionary radical thinking and then everybody else, it's the same track and the same stuff as, as normal um, because that's not going to get to your buffet if we've got these silos of who gets to have the pleasure and then everybody else has to have the pain. Um, uh, and then I'm going to completely contradict myself and um, <clears throat> uh, because I've been thinking a lot about the, the challenge of um, wanting to create these radical spaces. I'll talk a little bit about this in, 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 in the session with Gina. But, um, I'm, I'm intrigued by what, what, what is the possibility that's being presented by creating this different sort of world. UKRI has narrative CVs. We've been working globally with other funders around thinking about alternative uses of, it, of these in different ways. But what, is, what, what, is the, what if that is interpreted as a risk for somebody who that is the capital they need to be able to navigate an unequal world? Right, and so it sounds like it's it's this offer of this great opportunity, but they can't they can't carry it as a passport everywhere and just and just assume that it's going to get recognized that way. Um, so it can actually look quite risky to those who are either underrepresented and don't have the name, a whole set of things, and that's a very tense thing to navigate. Um, We've seen it a lot with people who are trying to create flat uh, research structures uh, on their teams. Um, and yet they have a person that's coming in for two years who needs to come out and have something to be able to go to the next job. And they are actually now in conflict because the radical difference of, of governing does not meet the needs of the person who's come into the team who might need to go out to someplace else. And they're struggling to try to work through that. So there's, there's something for me about how do we imagine a different world that also recognizes those real, real tangible conflicts that aren't just going to be um, resolved by having a three tangible magical things and then putting them on the table. That's probably not going to help those people trying to navigate those conversations. Right, I'm going to go online if you don't mind. Um, Courtney. Courtney, would you like to ask your question? Yes, I, I actually have two now two comments and then one question. Um, 
Uh, thank you, Karen Salt. Uh, you read my mind <laughs> when you were talking about um, how we need to look at uh, research and reward system, not just for researchers, but also for uh, administrative and support staff who do their part. And I also think a possible solution or idea would be not just looking at bonus systems for these things, but also looking at to really truly long term change the culture um, is when we're doing our hiring to integrate these things into our job ads. When we're hiring um, professors, um, placing a focus on um, open access, open engagement as being part of the, the job description, but also with uh, administrative staff. My question, and it might be a bit pro provocative, is um, when we're looking at uh, uh, access and um, open culture, it's a two-way street. So right now we've been talking about um, how to reward and recognize that within the institution, but looking at, for example, um, the number of people who are rejecting science um, in the US, in Germany, around the world, um, do we need to be looking into methods or solutions for recognizing citizens who want to engage with us to encourage um, their input into what we do at institutions? That's my perhaps provocative question, for which I do not have a solution. Sorry. Thank you very much. We're over here, and then we'll come to Gina next. Vanessa. <laughs> Um, thanks very much. Um, I would really like to come back to uh, Kurt's um, mention of sustainability and how important sustainability is. Uh, we, were, we were hearing about <coughs> collaboration. So just like how we uh, need to tackle climate change, we can only do this together. And if we look at, so there are indicators for uh, how we uh, uh, battle climate change, etc. We can also, if we want to have a more equitable higher education system, uh, we could reward institutions who are uh, 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 showing good practices, having open policies on open education, open science, so uh, that the leaders of those institutions can be showcased as uh, these bright lights for openness and if we are and we know that competition exists and that institutions want to be the best or the better well what uh, what we could do concretely is uh, champion those institutions and the leaders of those institutions who are going those extra miles so those you were touching on that uh, earlier so the champions the persons the leaders but also the institutions and if there are more institutions wanting to compete to be open and to be more equitable, we will have a sustainable, a more sustainable um, a higher education system that we can, that is so much more inclusive. So I think uh, we could quite easily try to campaign and showcase what are those institutions. And by chance, uh, Vilma is sitting opposite me, Delft. Uh, Delf, uh, Delft University, they have an open education policy and an open science policy. It's an integrated, very strong policy. They've got lots of activities. So by chance, as I say, Vil Vilma's here and I know her and they've done fantastic work, but there are many others. But who are they? And connect those institutions and those leaders who went those extra miles to talk to each other. So there are lots of libraries, there are lots of people, uh, uh, UKRI, there are funders, there are uh, big institutions, but we need to get the peers talking to the peers, the leaders, the rectors, uh, talking to the Frank Minor Mars uh, uh, more, uh, and get those messages out and for them to talk to each other. Um, uh, so I th I'm quite excited by, the, by some of the inputs uh, here, and I think we can do a lot by identifying these good practices and helping reward. Can we come up with a badge? Can we come up with some, you know, this, these institutions, you know, are Europe's leading lights on open. And it's like, oh, let's tell, that, tell their stories. It's like, how did you do it? How long did it take? Does it cost a lot? You know, that kind of stuff. So I'm going to stop now because... Thank you very much. Gino, have we any more? Anybody else wanting to say anything at the moment? Gino, let's go for Gino. 
Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm cognizant of time constraints, and my session starts soon, so I'll go. So recognition and reward, but I think that while we are speaking about creating a new reality and a new sort of infrastructure and system and possibility, that we should stop speaking about open as open research. Um, because right now, everyone's speaking about open research as the only thing like engagement or, or sort of... Um, yeah, engagement in the open. We should be looking at research and I mean recognition and reward for open education resources for that creation, for that use, for the engagement in open practices that faculty, that professional staff members um, sort of inhabit and infuse into their academic project and their contributions in the academic project. Because contributions in the open is what we should be recognizing as rewarding and you know um, these are opportunities for us to change the system to add value to effort and it's not just research because then we get stuck on open access and I think that creating open education resources means far more people are going to engage with those that content those resources it's ubiquitous um, in terms of where it could go and right now, um, if you're looking at open access, how many people are reading those articles and you want to re just reward that? Let's think. Gina, thank you very much. Andrew. Sorry. <laughs> Kate, Kate, we'll come, we'll come to you next. No, I don't need it. All right, okay. Now, Tom, to Andrew. Sorry, just two points. I was really supporting what Gino just said there about this being much more, uh, a much broader thing. Than just research it's surely about opening up everything it's about democratization of everything we've got it's not just about people working here about people outside can they come and use our libraries can they come and use everything that we've got on an equal basis to the people who are actually in the <coughs> institution something that's really really important to me the second thing i'd say is that all of this would need to be would needs to be very deeply embedded if we're talking about reward and recognition it's no good all, all of us agreeing and agreeing with a vice chancellor or two about this. It's about how within institutions we drill right down to the very basic level, job descriptions, promotion criteria, everything, and how they really reflect this. So, you know, it's a plea really to be right in the weeds from the beginning. It's great having a big idea, but we know that members of academic staff will tell their PhD students, don't worry about all that open stuff. This is the way you get on. Publish an article in a top journal, publish a book, publish a second book, you'll get promoted, publish a third book, you'll become a professor. It's kind of academic promotion bingo, really. So how do we move right away from that? Because even now the P PGRs that we've got here and any university, they're gonna be still, you know, they could still be academics in 2070. And we're not gonna wait all that length of time, surely, until we've got a long way on. So we really need to, do it and crack on with it, but do it seriously and do it in detail. Andrew, thank you. Go on, was, was, did, was somebody over here? Did somebody over here put the hand up? Oh, sorry, sorry. Vilma, go ahead. No, I just, um, in, in, in response to, to, to Gino, <coughs> perhaps what I forgot to mention, I just realised. <coughs> sorry. <coughs> So I've been very active in open access and open science, and then, then I was connected to Delft, but I'm now connected to the Freie Universiteit Amsterdam. So I moved away, and what I'm trying, my cunning plan, is to put open education as, 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 as important as, as open access and, and data, et cetera, on the agenda. I have not succeeded yet, because you, may, you notice that in this next open science plan, still the pillar open education is not mentioned there. But I think there is, so I completely agree with you, there is so much, um, um, it's the same group of people that we talk to. It's the same sort of arguments that we've used in the beginning for open access to, to explain why it is important to do so. And we can learn a lot from the way we implemented open access and also, for instance, the data steward, stewards in the faculties. And we can copy that for open education. So I'm completely with you. Thank you. 
Yeah, so hello, I'm Leonie Weingarts de Meij, I'm from Utrecht University, so uh, I saw some things uh, from Utrecht, so that's really nice. We are very busy with everything, and I want also to react on Gino and also what you said now. Because uh, I think that in the whole recognition and reward, looking at that, actually what we are doing within a university is indeed looking further than research, also to education, also to teamwork, leadership is really very important and impact in itself. So what is your impact as, well, any staff member within our university, either scientific or support or everyone. But what I was triggered by is actually, I'm a speaker in the next session on open education. And I think that the open education materials, the resources, I'm not, I don't really agree that it's the same as open education, uh, sorry, uh, the open research. Because research, the articles that we write, that is really aimed at sharing our knowledge, that's good. And it was behind paywalls and now we change that, that's really very good. But our education, our materials, they are aimed at the conversations that we have with our students. So we, this morning this was actually also talked about how does our education, what does it look like? So actually we are really busy already within our university talking about open education. And there are a lot of people, a lot of teachers want to join and want to, you know, share education and make it more open. But just making their materials open for everyone in the whole world, they are very worried that it's just part of the story, part of their education. <coughs> the, the, what they want to give to their students and what they, you know, together with the students, how they develop the personal development and so forth. So I'm actually worried if we say, okay, we have done it now for research, right? The open access way, and we are, well, we are not there yet, but we are, you know, doing a good job there. And now we will do the same for open educational resources. I think that is actually the wrong way. So I completely agree with opening up our education. So I completely agree, and at Utrecht University, we want to do that. But I think that in the declaration, it's talked about, for example, collaboration. And I think that, for example, is the way. Or to see how people can be, um, if you talk about recognition and reward, to reward people who want to make something not only for their students, but also, you know, maybe, maybe materials special, especially for, you know, students everywhere in the world, for example. But that's not the same as the education materials that you have for your own course, for your master's course, or anything like that. So although I agree in a way, I mean, we want to reach the same goal, I think. I think that we still need to discuss on how we need to reach that. I'm kind of worried that if we say in a declaration that now says 75% of our re educational resources should be open then it will be the same tick box that we had before for research. Did I publish, did I, you know, and then if I have 100% of my research, uh, educational materials open, do I get a professor or something? I mean, that's not what we want. We really want, need to think about what we want to reach. We want to open up the knowledge. And I think that's not only by uh, opening up the resources to everyone but more like collaborate with, well, the, the global north and south and so forth. But I'm curious, I see Gino looking like, no. Can I respond? Uh, no. No. <laughs> if, 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 we, if we've got time, we'll come back to it. I, 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 <laughs> what I want to try and do is play back to you what I think I've heard and check that out, okay? So I think, I think there's a, a big message around we need to... Um, uh, include open culture um, in uh, job um, descriptions and person specification, job descriptions, person specifications and in promotion criteria. I think it's the first thing I'm hearing. The, the second thing I think I'm, I've heard is that the, um, the detail here is important. We need to know what, what, those, what are these things that we're going to include. Identify 
what uh, the uh, what what is recognised, and that needs detail. Uh, that we should ask the community, ask people what they want. It's, it's not necessarily for us to decide, but the people themselves need to um, identify it. So uh, ask the community. And I think asking the community will help with this difference between what the student education community want, what the research community wants. What, and I think it will help with what Karen was saying as well about um, so those people who, who are maybe get, have the opportunity to work in a, in a radical uh, uh, research group, making sure that they're given the tools that they can go and get themselves roles or jobs in, in areas that don't work in as radical a way. Okay. okay. With. <laughs> I just said yes. Uh, okay, it has been corrected yeah. there. So it's with the community instead of yes, doing it to a community or, or ask um, them. Yeah. yeah. Um, partners in the process. And I think that there's, there's the, the other thing that I'm hearing is about recognising uh, the team, which is what something that Vilma said. There's something about mentors that need recognising leaders and institutions. And there's something in, in, in there is that you, you want what you've got to do all you've got, that's got to be coherent. Yeah. So that that's that's what I think I've heard in summary. Just wait for Tom and his microphone. Thank you. When we talk about job descriptions, I think it might be useful also to think about um, the panels that are happening for uh, promotion and who sits on these panels. Um, they are usually, I don't know, senior leaders of institutions, professors, etc. What if we open up these panels and invite everybody who wants to be part of these to be there so that we add transparency, we develop trust among the community and are a bit more inclusive. Okay, so which gets to Gino's point about um Telling the story. Was it Gino who made the point about telling the story? What's the narrative? Nigel. Nigel's story about, about telling the story. Because if, if we do that, that will get you into that. Oh, excellent. Right. OK. So, so what we've just done there is, um, in terms of those that get recognised, we've put citizens at the, uh, added that to the list. Thank you. Can I, can I just bring it back to what Kurt said about academic excellence? So in some ways, it's about redefining for ourselves what that means, isn't it? Because all of these things, in some ways, are counter to what we identify now as the way that we reward and recognise. So that seems to be what's happening in some ways. We're kind of subverting that idea. So what, what I've added in there under identify what it is that's recognised is that we need to challenge what excellence is. And, it, and, and in, in essence, what Kurt was saying to us, it's not about excellence. We need, we need, another, we need different language there. Thank you, Paul. Um, uh, maybe just on that point about challenging excellence, that would help with the sort of tension we were hearing at the end there. So there's a tension between the separation of research and teaching that's causing us trouble here. And I don't know what the answer to that is, but I wonder whether it's worth reflecting that here. That, uh, and, and maybe that thinking about what excellence means or, or, or what, what we should replace excellence with might help us think about how we stop research and teaching being in tension with each other and they actually become more synergistic. Okay. So, challenge what excellence is and that has got potential to make student education and research more synergistic. So, just to follow up on that point, hello. <laughs> 
Um, one of the things we're kind of losing sight here is that these are labels that we're applying to content that we're creating. Yeah. So someone may be doing research and they're sharing their output, the data, the process, whatever it is, yeah. in an open way. That can be used in any way that people want to. That's the entire point of making it open. So one of the things that we're doing, so my name is Kate Petherbridge, I'm from White Rose Libraries, and one of the things we do is White Rose University Press. And we're already seeing things that are published as, as research outputs being used in teaching as an educational resource because it's open and can be used that way and people can pick into the, the outputs and the cultural things in a way that they couldn't before because of the barriers to use. So I think in some ways by thinking about outputs in particular ways, we're thinking about how we're creating them rather than the use cases for those things. Good luck with capturing that in some meaningful way. Uh, what is recognised detail community? Um, I've, I've been asked to talk while you're writing because we've only got one minute. Right, OK. Um, I've, I've, I've added in vol value of outputs there. and that, That's trying to th recognise that the, value, the outputs might have different values in different contexts. Sorry, I'm, all I can hear is, is the speaker, so I don't know who's got the microphone. <laughs> it's, it's Selena. I'm, I'm just going to try and say this really quickly. Um, so the point about um, open, and I think it's in its word, is that when we are talking about everybody being involved, it's, it's the multi-level governance, it's the individual, the team, all the different areas that are involved in um, research or education. So I just want to make that point. But you're never going to get an open culture unless you've got transparency, because without transparency, you don't have trust. So my final words is that without good governance, you take the five principles, cohesion, openness, participation, <coughs> effectiveness, accountability. There's any more. We've got to get those principles in. Otherwise, we will never change um, the open culture. So it's just a point. All I'm saying is that you need multi-level governance. And that means individuals teams, leaders, from all the different areas um, in a university. And I'm just making the point about how important transparency is fundamental to the trust. Okay. okay. Selena, thank you very much. So, so oh, I've... I've, I've, I've I'm struggling now. So, multi-level governance, I've got it on the chart. So, I, I think for me, that what the, one of the key things that you've just said there that I think is really, really important is trust, is people need to trust the research, the science, everything that goes on. And that, that therefore, we need the governance, which gets us to everything else. So, part of me thinks we need to start there. Um, OK, thank you all very much. We're, we're up, up to time. Um, I will pass this on to Nick. And, and he, I will see what he can do with it in terms of pulling it all together. Thank you so much for your inputs. I, I very much appreciate it.